seminars on frontiers of the material science. Uh, today it's a pleasure and a honor for us to have with us to Thomas Wheeler from Michigan State University. Thomas, as you can see, uh, got a bachelor in arts, a bachelor of arts. This is quite a nice uh, name to call it, but in Spanish it's impossible to, to say mm -hmm. this. I like uh, the, the concept, Bachelor of Arts in Applied Mechanics in, in the University of California in San Diego. And later he was in Washington, uh, in the University of Washington, with his Master of Science in Ceramic Engineering. Um, later he was uh, during five years in San Diego National Lab. Um, finally, he, he returns to to University of California as PhD in material science. And since uh, 18, uh, 1989, he is professor in Michigan State University, who, where he is working and also he is collaborating with the Mass Plan Institute for Asian Forschung, mm -hmm. more or less in, in German, I said, in, in Dusseldorf, Germany. He, is <coughs> great research and also a, a great professor at university. He has winner uh, for best paper and one best poster award uh, that reflects the important knowledge, knowledge, knowledge creation in international conferences for research. And he's working in mechanical deformation, cold, warm, and hot working, creative superplasticity. Tester, measure structures of metals, intermetallics, and composites. Also in damage nucleation, grain boundary deformation characteristics, and simulation at measure scales, patches of microstructures with crystals, plasticity, final and models. As you can see, he's covering almost all the mechanical properties in material science, in materials in general, because he is working with different kinds of materials. Um, well, I think that it is going to be a very nice uh, conference, a very nice seminar, so that uh, the time is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank you, Jose. here with us, and it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to come, and thank you for your invitation. Uh, just as a comment about my Bachelor of Arts, I was actually had essentially a liberal arts education, which is not typical for engineering, so that is a bit different. So I will describe today some work I've done with a number of people. <clears throat> One of these names you may know, Carl Bollert. <clears throat> he has <clears throat> spent a sabbatical here some years back. And then my colleague in, in Germany, Eisenlohr. He's now with us at Michigan. So after he finished his time in Germany, at uh, Max Planck, he joined us. These are some students that have worked on what I will present, and uh, boys and and these other two are in, uh, in other laboratories. And so this work has been funded by US uh, research organizations, DOE and NSF. So the motivation for my work is basically, um, how does a crack become a crack? And that's sort of a deep question because you think of a material that's in good shape and then sometime later it has a crack in it and how did that happen? <clears throat> so the question is, what happens immediately before a crack nucleates? <clears throat> well, clearly, whoops, deformation is highly influenced by the neighboring grains in a polycrystal. And essentially, the neighboring grains impose boundary conditions on any given grain. And the boundary conditions are different because every grain has different neighboring grains, and the way that each grain deforms is different. And so, in order to really think about what leads to the conditions where a crack might occur. <clears throat> Crystal plasticity modeling of microstructures is important. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'll get cleared in a moment. So uh, 
we'd like to be able to predict and investigate heterogeneous deformation. Because if you think about a crack, that's where deformation is happening too much. And that's what we want to anticipate and perhaps prevent. So typically, we think that heterogeneous deformation leads to damaged nucleation. But if we cannot model heterogeneous deformation properly, then anything that follows from that, in the sense of an imperfect model, <clears throat> is basically fiction. And of course, that's not what we want to do. We'd like to pre predict. So therefore, if we can model heterogeneous deformation accurately, it will also enable us to predict the beginning of damage with confidence. And furthermore, if we get a good model in place, then we can use this good model to help us interpret what we see experimentally. So many of the experiments we're doing now are very complex and they reveal lots of subtle things. and Thus we get a chance to understand it better if we have a good model. So here's what I'll present as an overview. First I'll review some of the literature that's out there on uh, deformation and damage nucleation at grain boundaries. And then in uh, about 10 years ago we were doing fairly substantial work in titanium aluminide as a way to investigate damaged nucleation. And in this case, damage was nucleated by twins interacting with grain boundaries, mechanical twins. And then as we figured out what we could do with that material, uh, we thought, well, let's try to work with other materials as well, such as titanium and tantalum. And I'll describe some of what we're doing there. I'm not going to go into great detail on a lot of these things because uh, want to give an overview of this, what we've been doing. So if you talk with a mechanical engineer, uh, you might often think that how do I find, where do we look for damaged nucleation? Basically, you look for the place where the strains are highest. So continuum mechanics uh, perspective is rather simple. The more strain, the more likely damage is there. And so this is common amongst engineers in general to have that point of view. However, if we look at a microstructural point of view, we tend to associate damage with local strain incompatibility, which basically means interfaces, such as grain boundaries or phase boundaries. And so it's a little more complicated. In fact, I want to pose this hypothesis, which is not typical, that not all large strain sites are damage sites. And in fact, most of them are not. So here's my thought experiment. If I think about the vertical axis being the damage evolution process, I can imagine that I could have a material that strain, a portion of my material that strains an awful lot. And basically, if that strain accommodates a necessary change in geometry, I don't generate much damage. On the other hand, if I have in the same material a region where it is not deforming so much, but it does not also change its shape properly to accommodate the required shape change, then maybe we might get some damage. So in a sense, ironically, we might have the opposite condition of what, we just, what I just showed, that a smaller strain region may actually be a place where damage begins. And maybe nucleates a crack, and then that crack grows to the point where it then becomes a macroscopic failure. So, what happens here is really our motivating question. How does this crack come about? So the main point I want to make is that damage is not the same thing as strain, and that the lack of accommodation typically occurs at interfaces, and that may actually occur at fairly small strains in comparison to other regions. So basically, if we don't model the heterogeneous deformation correctly at an interface, then we cannot expect damage to be predicted reliably. But in order to really model what's going on at a grain boundary or a phase boundary, we have to know several things, that some of which are not easy. We have to know the orientations of the grains on either side. The grain boundary orientation and its structure is a low angle, high angle, special boundary. Do we, what are the activated deformation systems on each side of the boundary? Uh, and, and what is the stress and strain and orientation gradient in the grains on either side of the interface? And that's complicated. That requires a lot of very good modeling to be able to understand that or predict that. But basically, you rarely find all of that in one paper. Um, so uh, 
although heterogeneous deformation is commonly viewed as a precursor to damaged nucleation, the step between heterogeneous damage, deformation and damaged nucleation is not so clear. But I want to make sort of a side step for just a moment, a caveat. One of the places where damaged nucleation is pretty easy to find is at hard inclusions. Like in aluminum alloys, there are typical uh, what are called constituent particles that are typically iron aluminide. And they often, uh, in the process of rolling or deformation, will crack. And thus, we can have hard particles that may not have perfect bonding. And they may crack. And thus, we have lots of cracks that are already initially present in an aluminum alloy. And if we do that, then establish models for continuum damage mechanics, which basically sprinkles damage sort of evenly throughout the material, works pretty well. So I'm not going to focus on that particular case. Uh, I'm going to focus more on what if I don't have any pre-existing cracks. So just to illustrate the point I just made, let's suppose I have a region of microstructure and I have a damage site in a grain boundary here and another damage site, whatever kind of damage you might want to imagine. Then if these two points of damage are sort of linked together by a slip system that is highly activated, such as if I pull in tension that's tilted in a way that I would expect a lot of stress or a lot of strain to take place, then I could essentially get damage to connect between these two locations. On the other hand, if I had maybe even a damaged particle inside that may nucleate a crack, this particular site may not even interact with this one, even if it's closer, according to the nature of the slip systems that are involved. So this is partly the point that I want to make, is that slip systems are pretty important, and understanding what's happening locally is a, is, needs to be worked out. So here's an interesting example of heterogeneous strain in a copper multicrystal. It's not a polycrystal because there's only a few grains in this sample. It's grown to be a big grain size. And the people who studied this some time ago, I observed, interestingly, here's a great big grain right here, but in different regions within this grain, there are different patterns of slip that are present in different areas. So that means the slip in one part of the grain can be really different than the slip in another part of the grain according to how the boundary conditions of the neighboring grains are deforming, which makes it really complicated. So can we figure out how to handle that complication? Well, here's another more recent study uh, looking at property evolution at a grain boundary. And these folks have basically taken a series of nano indents that have gone across a grain boundary. And after uh, deformation, they've uh, investigated the spread of orientations that takes place in the grains on either side. And by just simply measuring the hardness on one side of the boundary, one sees that as you get closer to the boundary, it gets a little bit harder. On the other side of the grain, it's a hard orientation. It doesn't deform as easily as this one. And it doesn't seem to have much difference in how hard it is. So, this says that there's interesting things happening near the grain boundary that are different than what's happening in the inside of the grain. And this just shows how much things have changed from the uh, annealed condition before it was deformed. Uh, in the case of the soft grain, it's only increased about 25%, but in the hard grain, it's increased more. And so there's another example of issues that are important to think about. Uh, well. Not all grain boundaries resist slip. I mean, this one oops, here suggests that slip is somehow harder near the grain boundary. But not all grain boundaries resist slip. Sometimes slip can just go right through a grain boundary and just go on to the other side. So this is actually an image, a, a model built from a TEM foil by some folks uh, who study this in great depth. And have shown that if I have dislocations coming into a grain boundary, I can have dislocations going through on the other side, right, where they come in. And sometimes dislocations go off in a different direction in the same boundary. Um, also, some folks who have modeled twin nucleation at a grain boundary have shown that dislocations coming into a grain boundary can stimulate the nucleation of a twin at a grain boundary. And... Uh, also, just the stress state within grains can vary whether we're in 
the interior of a subgrain or in the walls of a subgrain, the stress state can vary quite a bit. So it's really pretty complicated inside of a grain. So I'm going to, with this as a background, give you some idea of what happens in TIAL. First a bit about the characteristics of the material and then a fracture initiation parameter that we've looked at. And then based upon some four-point bending experiments, see how cracks grow and whether or not we can predict where the crack grows based upon what we can figure out. And then some uh, simulation of an unusual situation that actually ended up showing that the rule is uh, shown. Well, I'll get, I'll get to that. Well, first of all, TIAL is not something most people are aware of. Some people have seen it. It looks sort of like face-centered cubic, except it has alternating layers of aluminum and titanium, aluminum and titanium. And the implication of this is that instead of having normal slip like we do in an FCC material where we have three different slip directions on a 111 plane, we actually have very different things in different directions. In these directions, which go across layers, it's actually difficult to move a dislocation because we have to go two hops before we restore the crystal order. But in this direction down here, we can just do a normal or ordinary dislocation slip. So that means in this material, we have easy slip in this direction, but difficult slip in the other two. And as a consequence of these being difficult, twinning, mechanical twinning, which goes in this direction, which is perpendicular to the, the other, is actually pretty easy in this material. And that's what gives it at least some ductility. Now, note the strain scale right here goes 1% to 2% or thereabouts. Typically, this material breaks at about 1% or 2% which is barely enough to be able to use it in a useful place. And currently, this material is now flying in jet engines. The latest uh, engines have turbine, titanium aluminide turbine engine blades in the back part of the engine. So people are a little hesitant to use such a, a brittle material uh, you know, in, in an engine, but it's beginning to happen. So we wanted to simulate some microstructures and figure out uh, why some of the grain boundaries cracked and why others did not and if we could make sense out of that. So here's some examples of some cracks in a grain boundary. First of all, these lines that you see here are all mechanical, not all of them, but most of them are mechanical twins, very thin mechanical twins. Um, this boundary here shows a crack that's quite apparent. Um, here's another boundary right here, which has some somewhat smaller micro cracks that have developed, and they tend to be correlated with these mechanical twins, right? Where a mechanical twin interacts with a grain boundary, in some cases, we get cracks. So the question is, why do we get cracks in some places, but not others? And can we figure out why? So here's the model that we worked through to think this, to figure this out. It's a little bit complicated, but I'll try to give you the sense of it without going into too much detail. So our idea is, is that if we have a parameter that can tell us is the potential for cracking high or low. Then we can say, well, I just described to you that a mechanical twin here can sometimes generate a crack at the grain boundary. Now, a mechanical twin has a strong sense of shear. It's very concentrated shear. So if you think about atoms moving down on this side and up on that side, we, we develop a big opening tensile force at the grain boundary, right where this twin is. And if we don't have dislocations on the other side of the grain boundary that can feed material into where the crack is going, then the crack is likely to happen. And so that's what this is basically saying. If I have a high probability, Schmid factor right here, of a twin happening, such as this, and if this Burgers vector of this twin is lined up more or less with the tensile axis, or at least in that direction. And if I have the ability to get dislocations on the other side to line up with this twinning shear direction, then maybe I can get the conditions that would lead to a crack. So that's basically what this is about. So if I look at intact boundaries and cracked boundaries, I see that I get a difference in the value of this parameter right here. So this is like a probability statement. The higher probability, the larger it is. So it's not a complete separation of two populations, but it is st statistically significant. So we had one boundary. In, in the 11 that we looked at, I mentioned that we only 
you know, first of all, it's difficult to get this information because it requires a tremendous amount of careful microscopy and orientation analysis to do this. So we basically found 11 cracked and 11 intact boundaries that we could compare. So here's one that didn't follow the rule. In this case, the, uh, the twins that led to the micro crack here were the third highest Schmid factor twin system. The twins that had the highest Schmid factor did not cause cracks. So that bothered me. And the question is, can we get insight about why that happened using a crystal plasticity simulation? So here's the model that we built uh, and then computationally deformed it. And what we found is that in this particular grain, this is the grain where the cracks started along this boundary down here, this is the twin system that was highly favored. It has a high Schmid factor of 0.5. And interestingly, uh, this twin system only had high activity in this twin system along the boundary and over here. But the twin system is very linear. It, it sort of connects the two regions right there. And what we found in the simulation is sure enough, this twin system was the one that was most active at the beginning. But if we just look in this neighborhood where the cracks actually develop, it turns out, if I just focus here, that in the beginning, this twin system was more active, and later on, this one took over and ended up straining more. So if we look very locally in a simulation, we could see that we have conditions that would account for what we saw experimentally. So this gave us the sense that we could begin to model very subtle features that, that help us predict the beginning of cracking. Well, that's good. Uh, the question is, can we use this in a predictive way? For example, here's a crack in a polycrystal of the same material, titanium aluminide, that was arrested. They came to a halt in a particular grain right here where there's a lot of twinning activity. You can see these lines. And furthermore, we can see that if we look in these particular pair of grains, which are here, using orientation imaging microscopy, we can see that there's orientation gradients. The color changes a little bit from place to place. That basically means that the crystal orientation has changed. And basically, crystal orientations change when slip is occurring. Uh, more slip, more of an orientation change. And it's not the same change everywhere. So now the question is, if we characterized all of the grains that are downstream of this crack, <coughs> could we predict which way this crack is going to go? In fact, there's a sense that it's heading this way because it's sort of turning this way. And so we have a variation of that same fracture initiation parameter that I showed you before. But this one pays attention to the fact that I am propagating. I'm going from one grain to another. So there's sort of a one-way directionality that's built into this. I won't go into the details on that. But if I look at the grains above where the crack had already grown and ask myself which boundaries are intact, which ones are cracked, I could get a pretty good separation between those two groups of boundaries using this fracture propagation parameter. So if it's bigger than one, it's more likely there would be a crack. Smaller than one, less likely. So thus, we could map out all the grain boundaries in the neighborhood of where the crack is not yet gone and see if we could figure out where the weak areas in the microstructure were. Well, this area is interesting because I mentioned to you that this crack was arrested and here's all these twins going this way. I'm going to zoom in on this one next time. So if you tilt your head to the left and then bring it straight up again, you'll see this same area right there. So I've rotated that image. And one sees that the, and along this boundary, there's six different little micro cracks associated with these twins. So this region looks like it's about ready to open up into a bigger crack if more of this twinning takes place. Um, and so if we look at where these cracks are located and the thickness of the twin, that's the vertical axis, and then these are distance going from this triple junction to the right, uh, there's lots of little twins and there's some bigger twins. And the ones that are cracked are the ones that are bigger. So the thicker they are, the more of a shear displacement there is. And here we see that. Um, here's a crack that is opened up on the side. Um, 
in the direction in which material has been shifting. So right here, the shear sense of the twin is this way. Once to, and hence, we're pulling material away from the grain boundary. And so all the cracks have that same shape. Well, here's a map showing all the grain boundaries. And then if we use this fracture propagation parameter, we can outline the boundaries that have uh, higher values. Um, and then the ones that are not dark don't have as high a value. So they would be more resistant to cracking. So the question is, well, could we, this seems like a possible prediction direction. But that's kind of strange, because if we just follow what these numbers say, the crack seems to be headed for this region where all those microcracks are. But then it's, this suggests that it's going to make a, a right angle turn and go away in a different direction. So that was interesting, what would really happen. So here's what really happened. Here's that grain boundary where all those little microcracks were. And they all linked together and made a crack. But sure enough, the crack made a major turn from the way that it was going and went in a different direction in the direction of those weaker boundaries. So here's the direction of the crack. And it followed basically a path where a lot of these weaker boundaries were. Now, to, to make a point is that the crack did not really go through the grain boundaries, but it followed a path of weak boundaries. Most of the crack was cleavage, which goes right through the grains instead. Well, this is sort of impressive about what could be done. And you know. The question is, can we also have a success like this with a more ductile metal, such as pure titanium or pure tantalum? And then in these materials, the ductility is quite high. In tantalum, it's like chewing gum. It'll deform a long ways, when titanium a bit less. So here's a, <coughs> a polycrystal sample of pure titanium. And after we deformed it about 8%, looks like there's cracks all over the place. You just look at an optical micrograph. They're not really cracks. They're, they're ledges. So there's some grains will sort of sink, and other grains will not. And that leads to shadow effects that look like cracks, but they're not. But with a bit more strain, we really do see some real cracks. And if we look at the microstructure around them, there's lots of twins involved. So those twins here, too, seem to be involved with cracking at grain boundaries. So here's what I'll talk about the rest of uh, my time. Describe a little bit in polycrystalline tantalum about heterogeneous deformation and whether or not we can uh, predict which boundaries are more likely. Well, I'm, we're not really, well, here's the, the difficulty. Heterogeneous deformation is a precursor to cracking. But the point I wanted to make is that if we can't predict the heterogeneous deformation correctly, then we surely can't predict where damage is going to happen correctly. So the real challenge with more ductile materials <clears throat> is can we predict heterogeneous deformation accurately? So that's really where I'm shifting the focus. Because it turns out that this fracture initiation parameter I showed you didn't really work in the titanium. Um, and I haven't even tried it in the tantalum because I just don't get cracks there. It just deforms a lot. OK. So we're going to look at a, a slip transfer parameter here, um, one that I will call M prime, which I'll describe to you. And then we'll also look at some uh, titanium samples in, in more finer and finer detail. So, uh, so grain bound, what's the role of grain boundary on heterogeneous deformation via slip transfer? People have studied this for a long time. It goes back to the 50s, where people first started asking this question. But here's a, the geometry of slip at a grain boundary that uh, turns out to be pretty useful to think about. If I have slip happening on this slip plane, the orange one, there's a slip vector. And then here's a plane normal. And then if I have a neighboring grain where I have a blue slip plane, where there's a slip direction and a blue plane normal, then I can just do some geometry, just standard high school geometry on this. Uh, and say that M prime, which is a parameter which says how well aligned are these two slip systems going across the grain boundary. And if the angles are small uh, between these two, then this number becomes 1. And if this is 1, that means I have a plane on both sides that where everything happens right smoothly. And there's no hiccup 
or no discontinuity at the grain boundary. So this number then becomes a measure of how easily it might be to get slipped to pass through a grain boundary. So other people uh, back in the early 90s and late 80s were investigating these uh, ideas in TEM typically. And so one of these parameters uses this angle where the slip planes make in the grain boundary as a criteria, but the, how well the slip direction passes through is also important. And in the work I just described in TIAL, the, this one right here, the kappa angle, is one that we use to help figure out whether or not fracture would occur. It turns out that if I use EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction data, to evaluate the evolution of grains in the grain boundary, I cannot find theta, which is this angle in the grain boundary plane, because I don't know how the grain boundary is tilted with respect to the surface. So we're going to use this M prime right here, which just has to do with the grain uh, plane normals, because that's something we can figure out based upon just a surface measurement. So I'm going to give you an example of how this analysis might go. It's pretty messy because for each pair of grains, there is as many of these M prime values as there are slip systems squared. So obviously, this only matters for slip systems in which slip is happening. <coughs> because for slip systems that are not active, then I don't care whether they're well aligned or not. It doesn't matter. Only the ones in which slip is active matter. So what I'm doing here is I'm sorting through, you know, we've got 24 slip systems in a BCC material that we can look at on 110 planes and on 112 planes. So I'm just sorting them from the highest Schmidt factor, 0 0.47, 0 0.466, going downward in grain number 97, which is this one. And then in grain number 86 right here, I'm also doing the same thing. There's the highest Schmidt factor, second highest, third highest. And they're gold or purple according to whether they're 110 planes or 112 planes. And so for each combination of slip systems, which I would expect to be active, or at least potentially active, I can work out what this M prime parameter would be between them. In most cases, they're really small, which means they're not well lined up at all to transfer slip across the boundary. But there are three of them that are somewhat larger right here, and they're illustrated here. So if I consider this slip plane with this Burgers vector direction and this slip plane in that Burgers vector direction, they're lined up with a number of 0.93, which is not perfectly, because you can tell <laughs> that they're not perfectly lined up, but they're close. So that's probably the most likely slip transfer opportunity. So then I can say, well, what do I do with that? Um, the most favored slip systems are probably not going to be participating in slip transfer or slip going through the grain boundary, but some of them are. Well, I can characterize a grain boundary if, if for no better reason than this. I can just choose the values that have high Schmidt factors and take the highest values that I find and just take an average, just as some way to go about doing this. I'm not sure it's the best way. So then we took this tantalum uh, polycrystal and we bent it and looked at what was going on right there where the strain is high. Here you can see there's this orange peel effect of the differing amounts of strain in different grains leading to surface roughness. And here is the original microstructure. Here it is after it is deformed. And you can see that there's gradations in color which stands for or represents gradations in crystal orientation. The, the, the grains are twisted and bent as a result of the dislocation behavior. And then pull figures of the same information showing that if I deform in the transverse direction, um, the texture changes a little bit. If I deform in the rolling direction, then the texture doesn't change so much because I'm deforming in the same way that it was already rolled which means that there really isn't any difference in how the deformation is continuing. Well, here's the interesting part. If I look at a parameter called local average misorientation, which is abbreviated LAM, it gives me a measure of the local deviations in how the crystal is just in a local neighborhood. So I choose a point, say, in the middle of a grain right there. 
it's sort of greenish right there, which means if I take that point and I say, what are my neighbors looking like? How much is my neighboring pixel of material different than my orientation? So if there is some bending in the crystal or twisting, then it will not be dark blue. It'll be sort of greenish or yellow. But what you, you note here is that along some of the grain boundaries, but not all of them, it got sort of red. That means there's right, right against the grain boundary, there's a bigger change in local orientation gradient than there is in the, in the grain interior. So basically what we're looking for are regions that have high geometrically necessary dislocation content, or in other words, dislocation pileups right against the grain boundary, which cause a bend in the crystal right next to the boundary. And we can detect that, the regions that are red. And so you can see that many of the boundaries here are not red, but some of them are. But then if I compare this, this has been deformed in the transverse direction, perpendicular to the rolling direction. And this one has been deformed in the same direction as the rolling direction. And it looks completely different in terms of the distribution. There's lots of dark blue here. There's hardly any dark blue. Um, and there seem to be more evenly spread out hot spots where there's lots of dislocation pileups and maybe not so common over here. So there's a big difference. So if we work out what this M prime parameter would be with a color scale, so M prime goes from 0.6 to 1 here. And so the darker purple is 1 and blue is uh, lower. Then I can ask myself this thought experiment. If I've got a high value of slip transfer, that may mean that I don't have to have a dislocation pile up at the grain boundary. Instead, the dislocations will pass right on through, which means that the crystal will not be distorted next to the grain boundary. So in regions where I have very little change in the grain boundary orientation next to the grain boundary, I might have slip transfer taking place or a high value of this M prime. And if I have a dislocation pileup where the dislocations can't get through the grain boundary and it causes the crystal to twist, then I would expect to have a high value of this local average misorientation. And indeed, if I look right here, this is a cumulative distribution of lots and lots of grain boundaries, I see that. I, for boundaries that dislocations pile up at, I have a lower value. And for boundaries where they slip right on through, I have a higher value. And that works great for the transverse direction, but it doesn't work at all for the rolling direction. So, so much for that theory. You know, it sort of works in some place, but not another. So I'm not sure what, I don't have, I have no explanation for this. I don't know why that happens. But it means that this parameter is not enough to explain what's going on. But we can still take averages, and we can see things that make sense. So if I see slip transfer, you can see some features like this that go right on through this grain boundary. Then I can say there's some obvious slip transfer. In other cases, I don't, such as here. I don't see slip transfer. In fact, I see a ledge developing where this sense of direction, and there's nothing. It doesn't pass through here quite so, so nicely. So I, where I see lots of apparent slip transfer, the average value is higher, but there's lots of noise. There's some 60 observations here, and the averages sort of follow the trend that we might expect. But there's lots of noise. So there's a lot. this is not a sharp enough determinant. We can get an average sense, but we can't get a predictive sense. So there's lots of things that we could do to improve this analysis. I'm not, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all those, but we've thought about it. It needs more grad students and more undergrads to do careful work and figure out what's going on. So next I'll talk about uh, some titanium. And we, we're wanting to simulate deformation in some titanium uh, to figure out if we could understand a couple of things. One is we can clearly see slip transfer going across this boundary. Here's some, the blue here represents basal slip in the hexagonal titanium. And it goes right through the grain boundary pretty well. It sort of matches up over here as well. But we also see these very strange features. These are like huge ledges that show up in the middle of a grain 
And they show up in a few other grains too, but they're not, they're not typical, but they're not uncommon either. I mean, maybe one or 2% of the grains show this thing. So is this damage? Is this a crack? What is it? And uh, we wanted to pursue that. And so what we did is we took an OIM uh, scan on the surface to get crystal orientations and then created columnar grains and essentially built a model of this has 19 grains, but we've also took some information we got from <clears throat> a kind of 3D x-ray diffraction in which we can um, essentially do something like an OIM scan beneath the surface, non-destructively, and so we can get OIM maps. And with a lot of effort, um, let's see if this, oops. Anyways, this thing, in some cases, will turn and spin, but because it went from one computer to another, maybe it won't here. But uh, anyways, this is like a piece of paper model. And with this, we can sort of build what we think might be the microstructure. It's very tedious to do that. It took a grad student half a year to figure out the three-dimensional geometry from slices to work this out. It's painful work. It's not fun. But with that, we were able to build a three-dimensional model <clears throat> that's a rough approximation of what's really there. There's 29 grains in this model. We did some calibration and validation of the model. Again, details that I won't go into here. <clears throat> and then if we compare a measurement of how the orientation changed from the starting condition <clears throat> um, to um, later, we see that there's you know, maybe about a 10 degree change in a band right through the middle of this grain. <clears throat> and the simulation that we did with the 3D microstructure sort of picked that up. But in the case where you just used the columnar microstructure, it didn't. So that means the true shape of the grains really matters when we want to simulate a microstructure. So the 3D shapes are important. Otherwise, we get something that doesn't match with what we actually measure. And once we have a 3D microstructure, we can evaluate several of these different kinds of parameters for what the value is along the grain boundary. And I'll give you a sense of that here. <clears throat> so I mentioned to you before that we have good slip transfer going across this boundary. And here too, we have a parameter here that, that says we should, the blue color indicates that. And it's a little higher here where it, uh, here too, well, I guess I have this backwards. This is the exception. This says we shouldn't get slip transfer, but we do get slip transfer on the ones that are yellow and orange. And over here, there's grain boundaries, but there are such good slip transfer across these grain boundaries that you can't even see the grain boundary because it's perfect. There's no evidence of a grain boundary. So it seems to work. But more interestingly, we were also able to work out um, what happens, maybe a reason for why these ledges happen. There is a grain underneath that has a high M prime parameter for slip to go from the grain underneath to line up with the, this slip system here. But this is a strange slip system in hexagonal metals. It's a second order prism slip. And <clears throat> that's never been seen that I know of. So it's possible that these are not slip, it's actually a shear crack, where we're getting cracking along the, um, a plane that normally would not slip. So maybe that accounts for what these funny features are. And I think the battery's done here, so I'll switch here. Okay, if, um, well, that's the same slide, but without that other part on top. So next, I want to focus in and looking at another set of experiments that we've done, uh, looking at grain boundaries very, very much in finer detail. So <clears throat> what we've done is we've taken nano indents and poked right next to a grain boundary. And if we do that, so here's an indent right there. You can see the orientation of the crystals on either side. And we find that there is strain that has passed through the grain boundary over here. 
And we can make a simulation of this as well, you know, with a computational code. But we can also um, measure the topography using AFM and get the actual geometrical height. So this is displacement in the Z direction. Coming out of you, coming out towards you is red. Going in, which is where the indent is blue. And so can we predict the shape change that's occurring when essentially one side of the indent is right on a grain boundary? <clears throat> and so here's an example of a an indent in a single crystal. This is just in the interior of the grain. And here's another indent that's right next to a grain boundary. You can see that the topography that is spread out over here is somewhat abruptly stopped by the grain boundary. So the grain boundary essentially is a block to uh, slip deformation. So the same M prime that I showed you before is what we're using. And the other thing we can do is we can figure out what the actual grain boundary plane looks like by just doing a fib, focus ion beam slice at the grain boundary, and we can measure the, the inclination of the grain boundary. And then we can ask some comparison questions. If I've got um, a single crystal indent, I have a geometry of the, the uh, topography on either side. And if I compare that same indent with one on a bicrystal where there's a grain boundary right here, I could say that there's a material on the right side which would be there as a bump, but it may not be the same shape of a bump if I have a grain boundary. So I can take the volume that has been pushed up here and compare it to the volume that's been pushed up here. That gives me a ratio. So if the grain boundary is blocking deformation, then I should get less of a push-up bump on this side than I do in a perfect crystal where there's no boundary. So thus I can plot a ratio of uh, this area to that area. And when it is, when I have an M prime value that is one or near one, meaning that the the, the grains are very slightly misoriented from each other, I get a value of 0.6 or 0.7, somewhere in there. But if I go to M prime values that are lower, <clears throat> then this becomes much smaller, say only 20% of the volume that's here. So thus I have a way of figuring out how potent is the grain boundary for blocking slip. Now what's interesting is that even if I have nearly perfectly aligned boundary, grains, <clears throat> I still have a resistance. It's not one. That means even a low angle grain boundary can create a resistance for slip to be transferred. And uh, this is pretty much the same story that I just said, but looked at in a somewhat different way. But I think I don't need to go there. So then we ask, well, can we simulate what's happening at the grain boundary? by creating a layer of elements on either side that's harder than the parent grain on either side. It's not perfect, but maybe I can somehow increase the hardness. And uh, so computationally, we can play that game. And uh, let's see, I'm slightly out of order here, so let me Go here. So if I play this game, then I can uh, find at what value do I have to increase the hardness of this layer to where I get the smallest difference between my simula between my simulation and the actual experimental measurement. So this change in volume here represents how good is my simulation at predicting the shape change versus reality. So if I increase the hardness to say two and a half times, just in that thin layer, I can make that volume difference minimized. 
that means I know how much harder that layer needs to be for me to simulate what that indentation is doing. And that's kind of nice. So then if I plot these values of this, how much harder is it, two and a half, three times harder, with this M prime parameter, then maybe there's a trend here. But there's not enough data points there yet to be sure. But it suggests that there might be a relationship that we could actually build into a model. And let me go back to this one. Also, uh, we can compare this M prime parameter, which I mentioned to you before, along with another one called this, the one that involves the tilt the, the, in the grain boundary plane. There's a mismatch of two slip planes. That's one that's this one. This seems to do a pretty good job, too, of making a relationship between uh, a volume difference uh, with respect to this parameter. Okay, anyways, that gives you the sense that we're beginning to be able to say that maybe we can simulate what's going on at a grain boundary and actually plug it into a model that can become predictive. So with that, I'll summarize. Basically, uh, with a limited ductility metal, such as titanium aluminide, or just a little bit of slip occurs before cracks happen, we could develop a fracture initiation parameter that, that did a decent job of predicting which boundaries are more vulnerable to cracking than others. But even in that case, cleavage still dominates the crack process, but the grain boundary has some influence on that. But for more ductile metals, the prediction of a crack nucleation requires the ability to really effectively predict the heterogeneous deformation that takes place, especially near grain boundaries. And that's a big challenge. Um, so clearly, all the neighboring grain deformation has a huge influence on how slip occurs in any given grain. And heterogeneous can either lead to damage or prevent damage. But can we figure out what makes the difference between what helps and what doesn't? And a relatively simple computational model, now I say relatively simple, the math of the hardening process is what's simple. Uh, there's lots of things we could do that are more complicated. Uh, but the key thing is with accurate geometry, we can go a long way toward predicting what really happens experimentally. And then the question is, how do we install these grain boundary properties into models? Um, and of course, another question that comes is so much of our observations are on a surface. So what is the surface versus the interior effects of what happens at grain boundaries? That's sort of a topic for another day, but that's something we're chewing on as well. So thank you for your attention.